Well, if you were here for the first sermon, you heard about the fact that there really are zombies in the world. So when you go back to work tomorrow, you can start telling people that your church believes there really are zombies. And not only that, but you can also agree with the pastor that there is a growing alien invasion occurring throughout the globe as well. As a matter of fact, uh, you can share with them that the cure for the zombies in the world is turning them uh, into aliens. <laughs> Afterwards, you can say, uh, wouldn't you like to come to my church this Sunday? Uh, I'm sure there's hope for you. Wouldn't that be a different way to speak to people? It's all true. That's the wonderful thing is it's actually true if you have the right reference. So what, are we, what we are about to discover now is this simple fact, that there are only two kinds of people in the world. There are only two kinds. Each and every single person in this world is either a zombie or an alien. So first let's consider uh, what our catechism question says in its first part with regard to this. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death so that he might make us share in the righteousness he won for us by his death. Now think here for a moment. If transgressions and sins are against the law, which result in death, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, then the law also says to us, by obedience and righteousness, there is life. So now, if that's true, transgressions and sins lead to death, obedience and righteousness lead to life, then the question now becomes and should face us, what will keep me out of heaven? What will bar me from eternal life in heaven. Well, number one, what will bar you is a lack of righteousness. Righteousness is required to enter heaven. If you lack it, you cannot enter it. But number two, sins and transgressions will also keep you out of heaven. In other words, what you don't have, righteousness, keeps you out of heaven. And what you do have, Sins and transgressions will keep you out of heaven. Now don't, don't give up yet, though, because here's the beauty of it all. Is that Christ wants to share something with you of his own. It tells us right there, doesn't it? He wants to share with us his righteousness that he won for us by his death. But not only that, but Christ wants to share with you the fruit of his death. So Christ has overcome sins and transgressions in his death to offer you forgiveness so that sin and transgression would not bar you from heaven. But Christ also wants to share with you the fruit of his obedience which is righteousness, which is the absolute requirement for heaven and eternal life. What a wonder it is that our Lord Jesus Christ comes to us and brings to us on the grounds of his accomplishments, whether it be the cross to secure our forgiveness or his obedience to secure our righteousness so that we might share in resurrection life. And that is it right there. Because by faith you share in what Christ has done, particularly in his righteousness, you can have resurrection life. I used to be Orthodox Presbyterian. The Orthodox Presbyterian Church was 
uh, you might say initiated by J. Gresham Machen, New Testament scholar. He also started Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. And in the course of his race in life, when there was much work to be done in getting this new denomination off its feet and organized and put together, in the midst of it, he got sick and he lay dying with an unfinished work to be faced with. And while Machen lie there dying, he sent a telegram off to John Murray, who taught systematic theology, and it said, thank God for the active obedience of Christ. Now, you may say, well, that's great theology, but you need to think for a moment. How did that apply to Machen? Think, just think. My work's not done. I'm not finished what I believe the Lord's given me to do. Here I am. It's done. It's over. And I've got to face the Lord with this halfway work that he's called me to. What does he rest in? He doesn't rest in what he's done or what's been accomplished or how vast it's become. He rests in what? That Christ has finished the work. Seamless translation from death to life. Beautiful, isn't it? That righteousness swings open the door for us into life. And so, too, you see in this text, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, that when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And we must think, how is it that God can make us alive together with Christ? He can make us alive together with Christ because Christ has died for my sins and has completed my righteousness so that I might be made alive in him. Otherwise, I will remain dead. Christ has dealt with it. And even if I share union with Jesus and his life and his death, so too now as I lie dead in my trespasses and sins, Paul says that he's made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Now that being made alive together with Christ is the quickening moment. It's awakened you. You've been dead. That old dead heart of yours, spiritually speaking, suddenly begins to pump. Suddenly begins to work. Suddenly begins to glow. Suddenly comes alive. But that's not all. Look, look, look at what else Paul says. Not only has he made us alive with Christ, by grace you've been saved. There's the big sovereign grace point that should hit us over the head with great joy. <laughs> He's the one that quickened me. But what? He has raised us with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That means, man, you've made it. You've reached the goal. Heaven's the goal. You're there already in Christ, Paul is saying. And Paul has taken these three interesting Greek words. And with each of these three words, he's added soon to them. S-U-N, to alliterate the Greek into English. It means together with. He's made us alive together with Christ. He's raised us together with Christ. It's all one word. Made alive together with Christ. Raised together with Christ. Seated together with Christ. It's God's power applying what Christ has done. Now isn't it interesting that in chapter 1, these same words are used with re reference to Christ? He raised him from the dead, it says in verse 20. He seated him at his right hand. 
That's Christ. Christ was raised and seated. And now in the gospel, it is brought and applied to you who are dead. Christ is raised, seated from the dead. Now you with Christ, you're joined with him vitally through the gospel. And seated with him in the heaven. It's like the end point is already here. See, that's, that's why I remember I drew your attention in chapter 1 about that word for hope. Uh, as the word pro before it. We, we, we hope ahead of time. See, we've already ahead of time been seated in heaven. We're headed for heaven, but we're already there. <laughs> By way of the Holy Spirit's bringing us into union with Christ who is there, and now too, we are there in the Spirit with Christ. See, Paul says in Philippians that we have citizenship in heaven. Now, if you live somewhere in Fresno on a certain street, then we say, well, this person has citizenship in Fresno. But right now, they're here. Right now, you're here. But you know what Paul is saying? He's saying, you have citizenship in heaven, and you're there. <laughs> Ahead of time. That's awesome thought. You've been raised by his grace out of your spiritual tomb in this world. And seated with Christ. In the world to come above. Thus establishing where your true permanent residency is. Now you know what that makes you. That constitutes you in this world. It means that you are an alien in this world. What is an alien? An alien is somebody whose residency is somewhere other than where they're at. Here you are, sitting here in the Clovis, California, in the Veterans Memorial District. You're here. But your citizenry, your permanent residency is elsewhere. And thus, here you reside as aliens. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. And Paul identifies you in the same way. Having this true citizenry outward elsewhere even by the spirit already there here you reside as aliens you see the church is truly a colony of heaven on earth a colony of people who belong elsewhere whose residency is elsewhere but we are here as a colony of heaven we're aliens and that's our true homeland which when we come to church to worship, we come to in a very special way in our worship to enter into that arena by faith in Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10. And all of this, Paul says, is by grace. He's done it. He quickened you. He raised you. He relocated you by his grace. And there's a reason why it's by grace. There's a reason why it is by grace. Because then there's no doubt in our mind who gets the credit for it. Why is one person raised from their spiritual tombs upon the hearing of the gospel and another person not raised from their spiritual tombs upon hearing of the gospel? Paul tells us why. He said in chapter 1, you're elect before the foundation of the world. In love he predestined you and those whom he elected and those whom he loved, he loved even if they were dead in their trespasses and sin and he raised them out of their spiritual tomb. He's the one who quickened and raised and seated them by his grace, not by your decision, the Father's election, not by your merit, it's what Christ has done, and certainly not by your power, it's by the power of the Spirit, grace of the Father, grace of the Son, grace of the Spirit. Why? So that at the end of the day, it might be clear in your mind why you come to church to praise God for grace. It's a response. 
And that's what he said in chapter 1, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. Chapter 1, verse 12, with regard to the Son, to the praise of his glory. Verse 14 of chapter 1, with regard to the Spirit, to the praise of his glory. This very same thought is offset when he says, so that no one would boast. It should be clear in your mind, crystal clear, why. The praise goes to God. And there's been no contributive effort on your part, decisionally, meritoriously, or by way of strength. Because of grace. Paul brings that point home. It's because of grace. Verse 7. So that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. When I first began ministry back in 85, I had another pastor in the area I became friends with, and he told me that Calvinists have big heads and little hearts. And he prefers a big heart and a little head. Brothers and sisters, that may or may not be true. But if you believe in sovereign grace, you should realize that sovereign grace is driven by the love of God. By the mercy of God as he looked upon your estate and now he says that it might magnify the kindness of God. God's been kind to you in Christ. And you should not have some frozen over conception of brute sovereignty. Because that's not biblical. It's not true. It's not real. But to imagine that kindness arises out of that sovereign grace to you. It should warm your heart. To think that all eternity... That in the ages to come, that's the plural, in the coming ages, the idea is like the waves of the sea. You don't have the wave of the sea. You have the waves of the sea, one after another. It's the ages to come, one after another, unending into eternity. A, A declaration, a showing that he might show, demonstrate. The immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness. Because brutality and justice should have greeted us for our spiritual condition. But it hasn't. It's his grace and his kindness to us. As he goes on to say in verses 8 and 9, For it's by grace you have been saved. he reemphasizes it again. He, he rolls it over again. For, by, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. The this, the antecedent to this, some will argue, is the word faith. I don't think that's grammatically the best way to look at it. And grammatically the best way to look at it is that the antecedent to this is the whole phrase. By grace you've been saved through faith. And this, that whole package reality of salvation by grace through faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The whole thing is the gift of God's grace to you. The decision, the merit, the favor, the power is of God, not of man. That's grace. Now the flesh, and please give due consideration to this if you would, the flesh is constantly finding some way to reassert itself. Now you should believe that and you should say this is part and parcel of my Christian awareness and alertness. You might say part of my Christian armor is to realize that the flesh 
wants to reassert itself, somehow wiggle back in there, no, I have a little contribution to make. I got to do this. Got to, got to, got to implement this next principle. Got to apply this next formula to my life to improve it, to make it better. And then when I do that and apply that and accomplish that, then God will meet me on the other side of that. What do we call that? That's called law. That's not called grace. <laughs> but the flesh is very deceitful. And ever since the book of Galatians, the gospel comes through clear and loud. And before you know it, somebody's got their hand down on this side, turning the, gospel, the, the, the grace knob down and starting to turn the flesh knob up. Less of God, more of me. It comes in all kinds of ways. But it's grace that eliminates the flesh's cry for being fed. Grace continues to say and to sing. It's of God. And it's for God, ultimately, that no one can boast. No one can boast. It was said of Abraham in Romans chapter 4 that if Abraham was justified by works, he would have reason for boasting, but not to God. But if Abraham is justified by grace, if Abraham is saved by grace, if you and I are saved by grace, we have reason for boasting, but it's toward God not toward some contribution that we've slipped in, some sidebar effort on our part. No, it's of God, for God, through God. Why well, Paul even wants to drive home, we're going to see in just a moment in verse 10, that the very walk that we have been raised up into, into newness of life, is a walk itself. It's by grace. You think, well, God saved me, now it's up to me to start pulling the levers, right? No. God saved you by grace, he carries you through by grace, you arrive by grace. Number second of the Heidelberg says, it's by his power that we too are now resurrected to a new life. And thirdly, it's Christ's resurrection. It's our guarantee of the end. The end is guaranteed. And so in verse 10, Paul summarizes it. He ties it all together here in verse 10. We are his workmanship. It comes from the word doing. We are of his doing. It's not our doing. It's God's doing. We are his doing, his workmanship, the ESV, and others translate it to capture that idea of the exclusivity that we are of his doing created. This is not referencing our first creation. This is referencing the new creation. As Paul says elsewhere, uh, you, you become a new creation in Christ. We must understand that when Christ rose from the dead, his resurrection from the dead was a resurrection of a new body, of a new life, of a new creation. That's what came out of the tomb. Christ, the new creation. You too, in Jesus Christ, in Christ, are a new creation. At what point does the creation ever look back upon the Creator Say, glad I could help you out. No. no you're his creation. Now here's the other side of the equation. We are not saved by good works or through good works. We are not secured by good works, but we are created for good works. 
We must understand the distinction between root and fruit here. The good works come out of the new creation. We created four good works, and before we start thinking, okay, I knew somewhere in this program that God was going to strap me with something. I, I knew it was coming. Here it is. I'm created for good works. Now that I'm a new creature in Christ, i got to get moving. i got to make things happen. Well, that's not true. And Paul doesn't want you to walk away thinking that. You know how he does it? Look what he does. Look what he does here. This is so powerful. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, those good works that we're created for, God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. Now here's, here's the deal. This word prepared beforehand occurs in one other place. It's Romans 9.23. Here's where this word prepared beforehand occurs. Romans 9.23 In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. Okay, vessels of mercy. Which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Vessels of mercy. God has prepared beforehand, before the world. He takes from one lump vessels of wrath, another, that same lump, he prepares vessels of mercy, and he prepares them beforehand for glory. The inevitability of this train of grace will bring his vessels of mercy to glory because he's prepared them for glory beforehand and nothing can do anything about it. Because that preparation is a preparation of his sovereign decree that Paul assures us in Romans chapter 11 that it is grace and not of work. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that any good work that comes out of your life or my life that's in obedience to Christ and honorable to him as a demonstration of the fact that you're a new creation in Jesus, God, by his grace, prepared beforehand that you should walk in it. It's the outflow of his sovereign decree in the concrete fabric of your life. And what does that mean at the end of the day? That means that you are free from having to ask yourself the burning question of all Christians throughout all time, particularly in the medieval ages, have I done enough? Am I doing enough? I need to do more. No. The good works that will come out of your life, he has prepared beforehand. And they may arise out of your thoughtfulness. They will arise out of your intentionality but they will not arise out of your energy. They will arise out of God's plan of grace in your life. He has prepared beforehand that you would be a vessel of mercy, that you would be a new creation, that you would be raised from the dead, and that out of that he has also prepared beforehand. It would evidence itself with true fruit. We walk in newness of life by grace. We walk from what we are in Christ, fundamentally, who we are, citizens, in union with Jesus Christ of the heavenly arena, new creations in our inner life. We walk out of that reality into whatever comes out of it by God's sovereign grace and will terminate in what we will be perfect blameless as he says holy chapter one in soul and praise god in body entirety and totality we are not created by or through good works but for good works which God in his grace had prepared beforehand 
that we should walk in them. That means you have the wonderful privilege of not only looking to Christ to save you, but looking to Christ to carry you through and to welcome you into the heavenly arena. Praise God. Christ alone, by grace alone, beginning and end, through faith alone. Faith being the means of trusting, the means of renouncing anything of self to find all riches in Christ, to God's glory alone, by the gospel alone. In Genesis chapter 3, we learned that there was two peoples. There are the zombies as a result of the plague of mankind through Adam. There are aliens, the result of the cure in Jesus Christ. Those are the two people carrying on throughout history with a degree of hostility between the two even as Satan and God have an unchangeable hostility. And yet, with regard to these zombies, there will be two potential ends. One, they will be cut down. But two, they will be cured. They will be cured. And if you've tasted the cure, <laughs> you've tasted the cure by sovereign grace in Jesus Christ that has raised you from spiritual death into spiritual life. Look how Paul develops this section. You were dead in which you walked. Verses 1 and 2 to verse 10. But now you walk in newness of life. You walked in death. Now in Jesus Christ you walk in newness of life. Of life. There's the difference from zombie to alien. Two different walks. And, and Paul tells, that's how you tell them apart. How do you tell a zombie apart from an alien anyway? Well, Paul tells us. The difference if you look at a zombie and you look at an alien and you say, I can tell them apart. It's in the walk. It's in the walk. There's a fundamental design. Divide there. One walks awkwardly in death. The other walks uprightly in life, in the power of God's grace. There's another way to tell them apart. What they eat. What they eat and where they eat it. The zombies continue to feed upon the fleshly bread of the deception and death of this world, but the aliens eat the true spiritual bread of life found in the church of Jesus Christ. And there's one last way to tell them apart what they say. The zombies are filled with moaning and groaning, but the aliens give thanks out of gratitude. They give thanks out of gratitude. That's what you hear them saying. For all the grace, for all the mercy, and for the great love of God that loved them even when they were dead and their trespasses and sins. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly